Hello and welcome to another episode of Don't Shit on the Bus. I'm your host, Adam Omakias, tuning in all the way from Los Angeles, California for episode 66 with Amanda. Now, Amanda works at Danny Wimmer Presents. That is a company that puts on festivals and she is the director of talent for Danny Wimmer Presents. And and the company she works at is in charge of putting on a bunch of different festivals all across the United States every year. Now, although those festivals are only for, you know, a weekend or a few weekends at a time, it is a full-time job to book the bands, get the clearances okayed in the cities, and figure out how they're going to do these. There are a lot of logistics involved, a lot of people, a lot of moving parts, and with COVID recently, everything's getting canceled and rescheduled. So it's not an easy job, and it takes a village of people to make happen. Now, this episode was inspired by when we were young festival. And I say that because not because it's a festival they do, but because it's a festival that I noticed a lot of misinformation about online. And you know, I figure if people don't know about this, I barely know about this. We got to learn. We got to learn together. So we got Amanda on here to talk about what it takes to create a festival, put it into action, put it on, have people go and enjoy in in a safe manner and what goes into that. So she walks us through step by step everything that they do to put on a festival. And along the way, we crush some of these, you know, things that people believe that aren't actually true. And that was really helpful for me because now I know. Now I know everything that goes into a festival. You know, my experience, I just show up with a band on a bus. We get off, they play the show. I take some pictures. We leave, we eat some food, hang out with some bands. It's fun. It's great. But everything that's at a festival was put there on purpose usually. So somebody had a job to make it happen and we appreciate you. So thank you for what you do. Thank you, Amanda, for taking time out of your day to speak with us. And of course, before we get to the episode, thank you to our patrons for everything they do. You know, I did not name you by name, so I apologize, but I'm pretty sure we got all of your questions answered. So thank you to Kelsey, Leah, and Christian. Christian, I know you ask questions all the time, man. I appreciate you. I know you're out there, South America, crushing it. Thank you for your help since the beginning of the podcast. And thank you to Kelsey and Leah as well. I appreciate you guys. If you want to become a patron, sign up, help the podcast on a weekly basis. That is much appreciated because that is how I'm able to do this. <laughs> it's kind of crazy, but that is it. So thank you guys for helping me do this, joining me on this journey of learning, becoming better, and hopefully inviting more people into the music industry. That is what we are here for. All right. I hope you enjoy episode 66 with Amanda. Thank you so much, Amanda. I'll catch you guys next week. On Don't shit on the bus. Hello, Amanda. Welcome to Don't Shit on the Bus. How are you doing? I'm doing very, very well. How are you doing? I'm good. I was, you know, if you're looking at the video version right now, I was kind of looking, trying to scope out your place. Like, it's, it looks really nice. I wish my place looked that oh, nice. Thanks. Thank you. I mean, I'm definitely, I've been here a minute. I've been here for seven years. I wow. should have bought the place already. I know. I know. Um, I like <laughs> it, though. It's home. You know, <laughs> I like it, but I'm not going to buy it. <laughs> um, no, I love it. It's home. You know, it's great to find a home in L.A. Oh, man. Agreed. What area do you live in it? I live in West Hollywood. What about you? OK, I am in Valley Village, newly. Where is that? A lot of people don't know. And that makes sense. It's kind of by Burbank, really close to Burbank, really close to Studio City. OK, OK. Yours is like blurry, but I mean, it looks nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. Right. I see. Oh, that's not you like, you like plants? Oh, yeah. You know? Got a lot of plants. Plants are the new animals. Yeah, but like every plant I get, I kill. So I should probably shouldn't move on to animals yet. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I, I'm never quite sure. I'm like, is this plant living or slowly dying because it reacts so slowly that I'm not quite sure? So I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> three months later, I wasn't doing anything right. It just took this long to tell me. Oh. <laughs> Okay, I'm glad I'm not alone in that situation because I'm going through it right now. I'm literally looking at a hanging plant. That's just, I don't know if he's well or unwell. And I don't know how to know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> a lot of asking friends on FaceTime. I'm like, this plant, don't know the name. This plant, what does it do? Tell yeah, me. Yeah. Water, sun, food, wind, how often, <laughs> where. That's all I need to know. Yeah, agree. Oh, it's so complicated. <laughs> all right, well, cool. I mean, thanks for coming on here. We, I, You know what kind of inspired me to reach out to you guys is not your festival, but the When We Were Young Festival getting announced and then all the stuff around it of people making all these assumptions about things that were happening that I was like, this is so far from how it works or what any of it means. I got to get somebody on to explain it all to me and everybody. So that was kind of what inspired me. 
Amazing. I'm glad uh, you thought of me. That's really yes. exciting. I mean, I definitely will say that that made some waves to say the least. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. What kind of waves did it make from uh, from your perspective? I know you're a lot more involved in the festival space than I am. I mean, you know, it's on one end, uh, the amount of texts and calls that Danny and I received about if it was real or not was <laughs> insane. I mean, people didn't believe it, you know? Yeah. And it was like, man, like, is it people were like, this is not real. This is a fake ad, Matt. This is Firefest 2.0. How are they going to pull it off? We were just getting hounded with calls and questions about it. And we're like, this isn't even our festival, but yes, it's real. And yes, it will happen. <laughs> yeah, it blew my mind when, like, if I see Live Nation on something, I'm usually assuming, like, oh, a lot of time and money was put into this. So it was wild for me. As somebody even in the industry, like, obviously, I know more than the average person. But if I didn't know as much as the average person, nothing about that to me, I would look at it and be like, oh, that's not going to work out. I'd be like, oh, this is fucking cool. That's a lot of artists. But I get it, I think. Yeah, no, there is, uh, there's a lot of questions around it. And, you know, I know a bit of the answers, so I'm happy to be here and explain the back end of all of it and, and educate the people. Yeah, we're here for the people. Well, I'm excited to get educated too. But before we get into kind of how festivals work and what goes into them, I do want to know a little bit more about you, if that is all right. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, you you come from Danny Wimmer Presents. That's the company that you work for. What do you do specifically there? Like, I, what's your job title and what, what does that entail? So um, I'm director of talent over at DWP and one of the talent buyers with, you know, I, I'm actually one of the only full-time talent buyers at this point in time. The rest of them are contracted on, which we contract or which we have different deals with to kind of help and assist Wimmer and I in moving forward as well as Gary Feedback. Um, and what I do, director of talent, is pretty much I help curate the lineups, negotiate all the deals for all of our festivals and pretty much oversee and handle anything that touches talent. Um, making sure that, you know, I, I'm pretty much an output for anything talent wise, making sure that insurance is handled, making sure that contracting is handled, making sure that payments are going out, making sure that, you know, all, every funnel of DWP has information that's needed regarding talent um, around our festivals, that and then the fun stuff of talent buying. <laughs> and talent buying is more or less like you are buying the artists to play your festival, paying them, negotiating the rates. Yeah. So talent buying is on our end, you know, reaching out to agents and negotiating deals and, and purchasing artists. I know it seems kind of weird to say, but <laughs> you, you, know, you purchase, <laughs> yeah, you purchase the performance um, of the artist. So going through that, you know, you think about a lineup on our festivals. Now this year we have four days, we have four stages each. And what's going to happen is that's about a hundred artists. So that's a hundred different negotiations with agents around what their guarantee is going to be, what writers they get, what production elements they get. And so it's a lot of fun. <laughs> that's insane. Are you incredibly organized? Are you very, very, I mean, maybe, I mean, your physical space I can tell is organized, but how is your like organizing all these deals? I have so many grids and so many colors and everything just <laughs> works in here. <laughs> and I mean, Wimmer and Gary will be like, hey, Mando, what's this? And I'll, you know, be able to get, I'm, I'm a hyper organized person, which is fun because I feel like in overseeing a lot of that, you have to have a pretty decent balance between creativity, um, knowledge of the space and organization to make it really work. Yeah, I can't even imagine. Well, you came to me from Shapiro, who I know is a incredibly organized person in his, uh, well, in everything he does. So I imagine you were taught well too. Don't let him fool you. <laughs> <laughs> we learned because we were the organizers. <laughs> ah. Love you, Shapiro. <laughs> yeah, he'll be here listening. Hey, Shapiro. It's wild to think about, oh, not only are you doing a deal for each person, but you're figuring out their insurance, their rider, all the details that go along with each artist. And it's like, I'm sure there's things that come with larger artists that are more work intensive than small artists. But regardless of the artist, you have to do all these things for everybody. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and everyone is unique. Everybody is coming from a different part of the country or different part of the world. Anyone from the Metallicas to, you know, a baby band that you've never heard of yet that we're trying to give a shot. There's just so many variations in what people need, let alone the quantity of yeah. that information and being able to get it done. That makes sense. And before Danny Wimmer, I know you mentioned like it's good to have like for this job, you need to be creative, organized, and mm -hmm. you need to have an understanding of kind of the space you're working in. I'm assuming you didn't join Danny's team at Ground Zero. And I know you came from another person that I know. So what was your path like getting to this career? Um, it was interesting because I was I always felt like when I was trying to figure out what career path it would be that, you know, I was fairly business pragmatic and organized when it come, came to everything like that. I went to business school at University of Arizona, um, awesome. but I knew I wanted to be on the business side of something creative. Like I wanted to be able to help these creative visions, these artists, these events come to life in some capacity or another. You know, no offense to any, I just didn't want to be an accountant. You know, I wanted to like have some fun business oriented life. And um, so I actually started interning at ICM between my junior and senior year. What's what's ICM? Um, it's the big agency. I forget what it's international. Oh my gosh. I forget the acronym now. I forget what it is, but ICM, like you have your big guys, you have WME, ICM, CAA, Wasserman, gotcha. UTA. So it's one of the big guys. And yeah, I, I interned there and just went and networked because I was older when I went to college. I was like, I started when I was 21. So I just was like, I need a network. I need to get my foot in the door. And when I graduated, one of the agents started a management company and was like, come over. And so I assisted him for a little bit. Um, I was introduced to the world of comedy touring um, through a comedian that he was managing and fell in love with like the fast paced touring world, you know, where it was like he was out at a show this night and a lunch this night. And oh, my gosh, all the deals are coming in. And you're like, this is chaos, but so cool. So that's when I was introduced to touring and I helped him package um, a show called The Roast Battle with Jeff Ross. Nick Nusiforo, the head of comedy touring at UTA, got wind and um, was like, hey, come work for me. So UTA picked me up and I worked for Nusiforo and comedy touring for a while. And then Shapiro was like, dude, you belong in music. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, sir, yes, I do. <laughs> so I went over and I worked with him for a few years and um, that's history, really. I you know, he, he moved on and went over to STG and, um, you know, at that point in time, I was like, do I love the agency life and booking tours? Yeah. But I wanted a little more creativity behind what I was able to do and what I was able to help create. And, um, when I became a free agent, I interviewed over at Wimmers and was hired on as my first task to book the Woodstock's 50th anniversary festival. That is a big first task. No pressure. I know, I know. But you I said mean, you like the chaos, so it's on you. Yeah, right, right. I'm gonna I'm gonna regret that one. Um, but yeah, no, I, I you know, I got over there with with Gary Spivak and and he just, you know, he's the GOAT, man. He's he's been in this game for 30 years. He's, you know, worked in radio labels promoting, and he just threw me in and taught me everything I know. And, you know, three and a half years later, I'm, you know, the director at DWP and having fun with it. <laughs> well, respect to you because, I mean, you navigated all these different agencies, these different careers. You went to school. I know you said you're a little bit older, but let's be real. 21 is not that. You were good. Yeah, I think you got it. You still went to school at a young age. I was like, how old are you where school's an old age? <laughs> yeah, I was like, what are you, 45? Like, there's no way. Um, so that was funny, but no, I mean, it, it, I think it shows that you obviously work very hard and well done on getting to where you're at because that is not easy. You said it so easily, but respect. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. It's, it's, it's a fun ride. This industry is a ride, man. It's not for the faint of heart for sure. <laughs> Well, I'm happy that you took a break from the ride, got off for a little bit, and you are able to take some time out of your day to teach us 
about all the things or some of the things, definitely just some of the things that you guys do and how yeah. a festival works. Because, man, it's kind of a beast. A festival's a beast. It's massive. It's a, one of the largest scale events you can put on pretty much, you know, when it comes to entertainment. It is. And how does it, like, you guys are going to, you have a bunch of different festivals, you know, I, I'm sure you could list them all. It's like Aftershock is you guys, right? Mm-hmm. All right, good. I was like, if I say a festival that's not Danny Wimmer right off the bat here, it's going to look terrible. But I know it. Yeah, yeah. This year we have, um, in May, we have Welcome to Rockville in Daytona. Um, July, we have Incarceration in Mansfield, Ohio. In September, we have, we're bringing back Bourbon and Beyond, which is our Americana Bourbon Festival in Louisville. Um, and then the oh, yeah. week after, we have Louder Than Life in Louisville. Week after, Aftershock in Sacramento. And then maybe one other. I don't know. We'll figure it out. <laughs> That's not an official release. Nobody, that is not official. <laughs> just to clarify, just yeah. leaving it open. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, when we were old festival or something. No, it's that's what we're doing. Actually. That's a good idea. That's a good I I feel like our festivals already are that though. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to name them that. They are that. Yeah. I, I mean, know. I come from Madison, Wisconsin, so I like new metal. And I've been to Aftershock. I've been to Louder Than Life. Good festivals. Well done. They are. They're they're I mean, I went to my first Danny Wimmer festival in 2016, which was Aftershock. And I was like, this is insane. I've never seen anything like it. Especially in the rock space, you know what I mean? Like you have your Coachellas yeah. and you have your, you know, your Lollapalooza and, and, you know, stage coaches. But to go and experience something in the rock space of that scale and see like the community behind it and how happy everyone is and just like this shared space and experience that everyone's having, it's, it's truly one of a kind. Hell yeah. Well, I mean, where do you guys start? I mean, with these festivals, like I, have you been at... I know you've been at Danny Wimmer for three and a half years, but since you've been there, have you guys created new festivals? Um, yes. Since we've been there, we created Hometown Rising. It was part of our Trifesta, which is a three-part weekend series in Louisville. Um, so you okay. had Bourbon and Beyond, you had a Louder Than Life, and then you had a country festival, Hometown Rising. So okay. I was able to see the inception in the first year um, the, of Hometown Rising come around. Okay. And like, what is, I think that's a good place to start with a festival. Like we could talk about like, you come up with a name or you come up with idea. Can you kind of walk me through? I know you could probably talk now for an hour if I say, could you walk me through this? But let's try to like start somewhere. I, I think like you figure out the name and then are you like date lineup venue or what are the next pieces that I imagine you kind of figure out simultaneously and go. Pfft. Believe it or not, the name like comes last. <laughs> oh, really? I <laughs> yeah, stand corrected. Yeah. It's, it's just like, you have so many other important elements to make sure yeah. that you can even put on the festival. You know what I mean? Um, with hometown rising, obviously it starts with the city. You need to make sure that all those fun permitting and alcohol, you know, liquor licensing and everything like that is taken care of. Um, I mean, in essence, when you start a festival, you're pitching to, a city to allow you to bring this business to them. Um, yeah. And they can say no, or they can say yes. You know, it's a lot of meetings with government officials about what this can do and what value this can bring to a city. And then, yeah, you, you know, get the green light. You obviously, one of those elements to it as well is like, you have to think about the venues that are in that city and what kind of radiuses and shows you're going to wipe out for local ven venues and you want to make sure to be aware of that and how you can work with partners and just really have that synergy when it comes to the city. Can we quickly go over radiuses so that people understand what that is? Um, so what a radius is, is it's contractual component for artists. Um, when you have an artist on a show, there's a stipulation in there to be able to kind of gain the rights to the artist in which they're not allowed to perform within a certain mile radius of whatever that show is. So for festivals, it tends to be a lot bigger of a radius. It, say you're taking Sacramento and you yeah. put a 300 mile circle around it. They cannot play within that 300 mile circle. For how long? 90 days prior and 30 days after. It, it varies when it comes mm -hmm. to that. A lot of the time, once you play our show, I'm like, announce another one. You're good to go. You know? Yeah. You want that 
show and that performance to be special. You know what I mean? You obviously yeah. want to draw or in Sacramento, we want to draw from San Francisco. We want to draw from our, all of these markets and not oversaturate them with an artist playing the week before a hundred miles away. No, that makes sense. So, um, we do that. And once we get, you know, once we get everything cleared with the city, um, we, start having those internal conversations about, you know, budgets and what build outs are going to cost and um, ticket pricing and really honing in on what our demographic is going to be, what, you know, is affordable for our demographic to where at that point with all those budgeting conversations, there is a talent budget allocated to me where they're like, Hey, if we sell this many tickets at this price, here's this amount of money. You got to make sure with the lineup that you book that we're able to hit that Mm -hmm. amount of tickets sold. And then you just go. (laughs) One of those things that you said, I wanted to ask about because I didn't know what it was. What's it mean when you say a build out? Um, I mean, you have to make sure when you go to a site, like all the staging, all of the building the festival. Yeah. Building it out, building, you know, um, tent structures, how the layout and flow is going to go. You don't want, you know, unfortunately, and I, you know, we don't, you don't want an Astro world situation. You want to be able to have numerous exits and, and, you know, people are coming in from a VIP area here and flow over here and can get from stage to stage. So it's really yeah. impressive what our operations team comes up with and hearing them talk about, traffic and you know how to get in and out and all that kind of stuff there's a lot of thought that goes into it for everybody's safety and and to make the entire festival site work that's insane it sounds it's so many more logistics than i imagined and i i had kind of understood in the past that it like the city matters i know a lot of people do shows in oh my god i'm gonna blank on the name what's the city where everybody does shows in california that's kind of inland do you know what i'm talking about festivals uh san bernardino And I know that people would do it there because it was cheaper to do it there. If my understanding was correct, that that's just so wild to think about like, Hey, we have to, we have to communicate with the city, have to communicate with the permits. We have to get all the band. Like, does it all just kind of come together or is it just one step after another? Like I'm trying to think about how you confirm one thing without confirming another. Yeah. I mean, once you get the sign off from the city, it's pretty much go. What the, the incredible thing at DWP is that, we are all in house. So unlike okay. other promoters, like there will be talent buyers and then you'll like hire Superfly to come in and do operations or, you know, a concessionaire to come in where we have Soho concessions. We have an entire operations team. We have a tire production team that works under a DWP umbrella. So we're like a one-stop shop festival build out company. Um, from beginning to end. And it's very rare for that to be in an independent promotion company. And is that because of Danny? And you'll have to forgive me, I'm blanking on the other guy's name that you work under. Uh, Gary Spivak. Gary, is that because of their kind of experience in the industry and all the people they know, they've kind of built these different parts? Maybe not tech, like, is it part of Danny Wimmer or are they just people you work with closely? Oh, no, it's full-time Danny Wimmer staff. Oh, that's awesome time non-contracted showing up and, and making it happen that's amazing it is kind of interesting how you say it because when i talk about it sometimes we don't sit back and think about what we do we just do so yeah sitting here talking about it it does kind of seem like all of a sudden it just happens and it kind of feels like that <laughs> like all of a sudden you're just making it happen you know but yeah i mean it, it is very awesome it's fun Yeah. And I don't know about you, but when I do something so regularly like photography and I know how to use a camera and I go and shoot a show, I think it's easy because all the things I know, I'm like, oh yeah, it's easy. I could tell you all this in one day or whatnot. But then to learn all that. And I remember this when I try to learn something new and somebody else is teaching me, I'm like, holy shit, this is so much slow down. So it's so nice to have somebody like you who literally knows all the answers off the top of their head, break it down for us because it's not easy for us. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, that's the beginning process of it. And then obviously everybody kind of disperses to their own departments and starts okay. working. So you go from there to, you've got the city unlock, you've got the, maybe not the name yet. You've got kind of a, 
a blueprint for everything. You know, the name comes to you. You got the bands, everything. It, it'll name itself. I kind of get the vibe. It does. It does. And it's so fun for everybody to like try on different hats with names. It'll be, we'll have an internal email thread where everyone will be like, uh, hometown, like hometown rivers or hometown, you know, and we'll be like, oh no, that's just not it. You'll call it it for a week. And it's really fun, actually. <laughs> do you have any names you can share for us for festivals you didn't use or do you have to save those for? Oh my gosh. There was like with the Sacramento, with Hometown Rising, I think it was really interesting because you also hone in on the city and what the city brings. And Sacramento ha is like a big farming town, which I had no idea about. <laughs> So there was a lot of like prairie stuff thrown around and, you know, golden prairie rivers in because it was like a gold. It was a, a city back in the day that they found a lot of golden in the rivers and became a farming town off of that. So we were like, oh, that's cool. Oh, you know, uh, it, it, yeah, it was it was really interesting. So. Oh, man. All right. Well, let's say let's continue on your journey. So you're booking everything. You're making sure it works logistically. Is there a process in obtaining all these artists and kind of figuring out where they show up on the bill? Like, are you like, all right, we've got, you know, I'm just going to say random names. These are by no means meant to yeah. mean anything, but like we've got Metallica, but you know, Slayer wants to play above them, but Metallica needs their name. Like, is there like a whole juggling process of like, we've got Metallica confirmed now disturbed will play, or we've got disturbed confirmed now another band will play, or is it just a money kind of conversation when you're buying this talent? It is exactly what you said. It is probably the hardest or most difficult part of the job is that Gary will always say like you have 85 masters. Every band wants something else. Every band feels, you know, wants to okay. be billed above the other, wants that stuff. So it's definitely Tetris. But initially you always start from the top down. We start with okay. who our headliners are going to be and who we want to see, you know, really carry the festival. Those conversations start years in advance. I mean, oh, wow. the Metallica conversation was six years in the running. That's wild. Yeah. So, I mean, there's there's your corns and your Avenged Sevenfolds and stuff like that. But you're like, okay, they're going to be on a touring cycle. They haven't played this festival in two years. So let's bring them back. And yeah, we definitely start from the, the, from the top down. A lot of conversations with agents, with managers um, to get those, you know, our top headliners locked in. And once you do that, you kind of just start building it out who they're touring with. Will they be on tour? Because obviously like if Metallica is on tour with Slayer, it's like, it's natural. We do it yeah. together. Put you know? Slayer so, on it too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, that It's that kind of process. Once you get down to like your, you know, your undercard, I would say it's definitely becomes a money game. You see how much you have left in your budget when you have solidified Foo Fighters and Metallica and, and Corn and Avenged and Bring Me and all of those types of things, because those are obviously what's going to sell, but the bulk of it matters as well for all of us. So, and what's undercard mead? Like your anything, what I consider that is anything below probably your third line on an ad mat. You okay. know, like your bread and butter, your up and comers or your super old school stuff that's just like back on tour for a minute. I consider it anything like 40K and below. Okay. That makes sense. I mean, it's good. It's kind of nice to know ballpark because like, why would anybody know how much a band costs to put on a show? You know, yeah. that's just not something anybody knows. That's why I, I can't imagine trying to, I feel like my response for everything when somebody comes on and talks about things that I just don't know about is I was like, that's wild because <laughs> everything yeah. in the music industry blows my mind. I'm like, what? You have to, it makes sense. You stop from the top, start from the top down though, because I imagine once you get Metallica or an artist of that size, everybody else is like, yeah, we'll play. We'll play the festival. Just put us close. You know, exactly what you said. Like everybody, the first question is like, oh, well, like who's the headliners? Okay. We like, we're interested, but like who's headlining? <laughs> <laughs> Can it be us? Yeah. <laughs> Fever 333. Are you sure we're not there yet? <laughs> Love it. But yeah. <laughs> like, um, no, everybody is very interested. It's a selling point, you know? I mean, it is by far the selling point for new festivals, for sure. Because, you know, you want to make sure that, it, like in Hometown Rising in 2019, 
they were like, well, who's going to headline? This is a new festival. It was right in the midst of fire fest extravaganza and all that. And everyone was like, well, does this festival have any legs? What happens if it gets canceled or shut down? And we need to know that headliners are taking the same risk we are. Um, yeah. So with newer festivals, it's a lot more headliner dependent. Our older festivals, like the Aftershocks and stuff, everyone knows that it's going to it's gonna be someone huge. I looked up the Hometown Rising lineup. I can't say I know many of the artists, but they do all sound like really good, powerful Are you not names. a country guy? I don't know. I know I'm not a country guy because I don't listen to country music, but maybe I look like one and I don't know. No, <laughs> don't, no, I'm like envisioning like a hat, a cowboy hat and like a plaid shirt. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. No, I know too I little. Say, you don't scream cowboy guy to me. <laughs> just like, I would get, I think I would be, I would look closer to the singer of Disturbed than I do a country person just because I'm bald. There you go. Do you get that often? Never. I wish I could. Yeah. I remember I saw I saw him once when I was at a festival and you like a download and he is like a lot shorter than I imagined, which I never gathered when I was a kid. But I'll, I'll get fishtail piercings like, let's go. Those things are do wild. Do it. Do it. I'll pay for it. <laughs> Come with me. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'll literally I'll hold your hand. We'll go and get it done. I'm cheaper than a lower card. Did I use the right <laughs> term? Lower card, right? <laughs> Undercard, lower card. Yeah, Undercard. Yeah. Damn it. God, yeah. I'm trying to, I even take notes. All right, I missed that one. Okay, cool. So we've got, let's pretend we got the lineup figured out. We got the city locked in. Is this all before the festival's announced? Everything? All, oh, well before, like over, I mean, it's usually about six months before the festival's announced at least. And then mm -hmm. about a year before the festival plays out. Okay. And then, no, you're good. Um, I was about to say that the, the city, I mean, getting the city and stuff locked in happens usually a year, at least a year or two in advance. Like okay. you have to make sure that that's locked in, but yeah. And then bands, however many months in advance, I'm assuming, assuming that's after the city's locked in, but before it's announced. And then is there anything else that goes on of significant value before announce announcement date? Other, I'm assuming like making the website, that kind of stuff. Oh yeah, asset build outs, website. I mean, one thing is, is that getting a lineup solidified is one thing, but like you mentioned before, there is so much more that goes into it than a band just saying, yeah, I accept X amount of money. Um, <laughs> when you get to the ad mat, it is probably the worst part of our job. Like weeks of a band being like, oh, wait, but like I should be in front of them or like, no, no, no. Like I need to be a little bigger or like I should be to the left on line three. It's weeks of that. Adam. It's nauseating. Are you like, we need we need to see your head count at venue. Like what determines somebody's ability other than like, for example, Metallica, like I, there's very few bands who put a headline above them because they're just massive. But when you get down to the artists, like let's say, you know, they're playing the four o'clock slot on main stage or five o'clock slot on main stage, not quite headliners, but still a pretty prominent role in the day. What determines that? Is it how many people you draw? Like how big it looks for the festival? Is it all these things or? When I go into booking on that level, as well as like ad mat negotiations and arguments, I always pull data and analytics. I look <laughs> and at arguments. Streaming. <laughs> yeah, I literally do. And I will, I will tell agents, I was like, this is what I see comparatively to X, Y, and Z band. Let's go. Like, tell me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Show me your receipts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like we can have this conversation. It's great. It's, it's a negotiation, but I um, pull streaming analytics. I use chart metrics a lot about fan engagement, um, demographics, all those types of numbers. I pull poll star numbers when it comes to hard ticket sales, um, what they do in the market that we're specifically having the festival in. There's a, you know, there's a lot of data that can go for arguing if you should be before or after somebody, you know? So if you ever want to really start beef with a band online, you can hit them up and be like, why is your name so low on the ad mat? <laughs> <laughs> Don't do it. Don't. It'll cause why is it war. so small? Why is it the it's same size? It's going to war. <laughs> it's insane. Oh, I'm like, man. at some point, you're just like, this is great. We're going to play. Like, you're welcome. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's, man, there's so many intricacies that you just didn't know about. I've heard like, because I've toured with artists, I've heard some conversations on the back end. And I know that like, I always thought it was really interesting that bands intentionally try to tour 
with uh, a show that proves they could be a headliner of a festival. And I always thought that was interesting because once you become a headliner, then you can headline festivals, but getting there is so hard. And it's like hearing you speak shows how important it is. I mean, I, you know, it's really difficult, especially in the rock space. You know, we, I think one of the biggest conversations that everyone has is who's the next headliners, you know, I mean, who's the next Metallica, who's the next Foo Fighters, who's the next, you know, so it, it is difficult. It's very difficult. It takes a lot of years. It takes a lot of, you know, the right timing, fan engagement. It takes so much. I mean, I'm not envious by any means of, of the battle of that journey for sure. Yeah. I can't even imagine. Well, congrats to the new headliners. I think Bring Me has been doing a very good job and I welcome mm-hmm. them to that world because they're a great live band. In- incredible. One of my favorites. After that, do you announce the show. Like where are we at? Um, so what's interesting is, you know, we announce all of the show, we announce the shows and stuff like that. Marketing teams go into full effect, radio advertisements, everything like that. Um, build out really starts happening, you know, production secures stages, secures lighting rigs, secures tech, all of that. Um, and then it's a lot of conversations about mapping, about where things are going to go leading up into selling tickets in the festival. But I think the most interesting thing, and I always say this, <laughs> is that everything at the company starts and stops with talent by okay. or talent, the talent department in general. So, you know, we're announcing Aftershock on Wednesday. Um, and then, you know, two weeks later, we'll be announcing Louder Than Life and then a week later. And so marketing and production and operations, they're full force thinking of 2022. And I'm already starting to buy for 2023. Like 2022 is done for me. I can't even like don't. You don't exist in this year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like I obviously, you know, fans drop off and you have to replace them and stuff like that. But I'm already in 2023 when everyone's just super focused on 2022. Man. Yeah. I mean, you guys have to plan ahead with how long it takes to do everything. So that makes sense. I think COVID definitely changed the name of the game too a little bit. You just have to, I mean, you just have to buy further out, especially with all the tours that have been picked up and moved and the cancellations. It's like, we don't live in the same space of, Hey, let's start buying for a festival three months before an ounce anymore. It's, it's, you just have to prepare more. So it's changed. It's changed everything just because of how everything can change so quickly. Oh yeah. It, it's, you know, and the preparation that people, I mean, right now I don't think we're fully caught up, but you know, I know for 20, so 2020 festivals, we tried to move into 2021, try to keep as much of the same lineup as we could. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden we're almost wrapping up 2021 and all these bands and agents are hitting us up like, Hey, we picked up our tour for 2022 and it lands here now. And we want this festival. And it was like, Whoa, we haven't even, <laughs> like, you guys are so, <laughs> Whoa. You know what I mean? Like we're not even there yet. So it's made us have to really step up the game and, um, yeah, just think more, think, think ahead more, which in, in, in general, I feel like that really gives us an advantage when it comes to being able to take more festivals on, create more festivals, you know? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, your job sounded difficult, but it sounds more difficult under the stipulation of do this in three months or do it in a lot yeah. less time or a lot less closer. Okay. I, part of this is just me saying that I don't know all the questions to ask. Do you think you could kind of, from here on out, like what happens up until show day? Promotion? A lot of uh, band engagement. We really lean heavily on bands to post, to do different, you know, um, Instagram lives with us, promote our shows with us, um, come on to our Twitch channel. Um, we, I mean, we rely, the bands are a marketing tool for us. So we work hand in hand with a hundred bands to make sure that they push and really help us sell these tickets to in turn, you know, have them perform in front of 40,000 people sold out. Once it's announced, it's definitely a game of marketing. Okay. Just pushing it. Yeah. Just pushing hard. I mean, every day you get very, you know, you get ticket counts to see what, how many were sold the night before and it's suspenseful and you're like, Oh, you know, our projections aren't on, on the right path to our sellout goal. So what are we going to do to get there? How are we going to do some creative marketing? How are we going to, you know, ask, 
you know, Lars from Metallica to come on live and do a giveaway on it, you know, things like that to really help people be engaged and want to buy tickets. It sounds anxiety inducing, knowing ticket counts every day. That's like too much information. Sometimes I just file it. Sorry, winner, if you're watching. <laughs> What'd you say? He's like, you're supposed to know. Sometimes <laughs> I just file the email and don't look. I'm like, no. <laughs> you're like, I want it to be a surprise. Yeah, yeah. Once a week, surprise me. <laughs> yeah, I would argue that some careers in this industry are borderline masochistic. And am I saying that word right? Masochistic? Every time yeah. I say that word, it sounds yeah. weird. And you found a way to make it not so painful. You know, you don't need another ticket counts every day. Once a week is, a, yeah. Yeah. is enough. Not painful. I mean, actually, it's a good thing. Yeah. I literally tell people every day, I'm like, yeah, I'm masochistic. Like this career is is, is definitely on brand with that for sure. <laughs> oh, man. And then, I mean, come show day. Mm-hmm. I want to know, I know your job maybe isn't as intensive come show day. It's maybe a, yeah. a reward for all your hard work you've put in. But can you within reason, I know that I'm not asking for privileged in- information or anything, but I would love to know some examples of things that come up show day on the, there's so many festivals, so many moving parts. Like what are some examples of fires that have to be put out on site day of for these massive kinds of shows? Oh my goodness. There. <laughs> oh gosh. <I'm- laughs> the fun ones, just the fun <laughs> like, ones. Do we go pre pandemic? Do we go during pandemic? I don't know. What's the most interesting? I I, I don't want to hear like co- somebody got COVID. We canceled. Like we all know that one. Like, no, let's... no, no, no. Uh, how about like entire shuttle bus staffs quitting and nobody <laughs> being able to get off site? <laughs> like all of our That's shuttle staff. Yeah, they quit at incarceration this past year. They were just like, we, you know, it was, it's so hard right now to find people to work, honestly. And so a lack of staff and, you know, staff not being, you know, well-trained or something like that. Because like, they're newer. That's prob- yeah, yeah, because they're new. You know, they've never done it before. So that's probably where a lot of problems come from. Um, bands not being able to get there. Like, and you literally having to do, I mean, an hour before someone performs, them being like, my bus broke down. And you're like, great. Get on a plane. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, constantly having to do that when those, when those situations happen, we have to, you know, on like real time shift set times, shift them on socials, get them out to everybody who's a ticket buyer. So they're not showing up to a set at a wrong time, upset with us about not informing them. Everything you can think of. Yeah. If it's raining, like being able to control, uh, how muddy it is bringing in, tons and like literal tons of rocks and gravel to be able to (laughs) spread it across the main stage area. So people aren't stepping in puddles. Like there's always issues by the way, like day of, it's just like right up until doors, you know, you hear on your intercom 30 minutes till doors and you're looking around like, how am I going to do this? (laughs) Like what? (laughs) What? They're literally laying gravel right now because it's raining. (laughs) It always works. Oh my God. So what did you think personally when you watched the Firefest documentaries then? Were you just like, this is insane? I was like, thank God this is brought to light. Like everybody <laughs> thinks they can just do it, you know? Here's yeah. a here's a you know, like here's a park. Let me sell tickets to some it's not like that. There is so much that goes into it. And I was kind of glad. I was not surprised at all, but I was really glad. I'm like. You didn't have faith in Ja Rule. What is wrong with you? You didn't have faith in him to put on a festival? Oh, horrible. I know. Oh, my God. That that was crazy. And if you haven't watched yeah. the documentaries, I highly suggest it. There's like a few oh, different yeah. ones that came out, but they are very entertaining and sad at the same time. I feel, you know, I it was hard to feel bad to, for the fans sometimes because of how they were acting. But at the same time, I was like, these people didn't know it was going to be this bad. Like you can't, you yeah. never think that. So uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good watch to, to know how much work Amanda and her team do do in the right way. No fire fest yeah, on your belts. I, I, I was blown away, man. What happened to that guy? <laughs> Billy McFarland? I don't know. Really? We need to, we need to find out. We need to find out what happened to him. I'll get him on the podcast. It'll go well. <laughs> do it. Do It'll it. It'll go really well. Connor. <laughs> Can you, can you reach yeah. out? Hey, man. Perfect. Connor said yes. Uh, so 
I wanted to know a little bit more about putting on the festival. I know that you have your in-house teams and you hire people locally. Could you give us kind of like a head count of each of those so we understand like how big these teams are? And then moving forward, there's a lot of people who listen to this podcast who want to get involved on a local level or on an industry level. Could we talk about kind of how they can do that and what's available? Yeah, absolutely. So our direct in-house team, I think right now we've gotten back up to around 30 employees who are like full-time working year round to make these festivals happen, whether it be immediate future or not. The contractors and people that we hire on on site from security guards to bartenders to stage hands and stage managers. I mean, it's in the hundreds easily. It's yeah. I don't know the exact number for it. I know our artist relations team is a team of 10. Transportation is a team of 20. Oh, wow. Big teams. There, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of people to need to make it happen. When you have, you know, Metallica who has four runners every day themselves, you know, those are, you gotta, you gotta get people to and from places and, well, there, there are big teams. I would say that I think our security is in the 200 range. Don't quote me on that, but Will not um, quote. yeah, it's a, it's a lot of, it's a lot of staff for sure. But our core team is around 30 right now. So if, if people want to work and maybe this isn't an option and that's okay too, if people wanted to work for Danny Wimmer specifically, or they wanted to work for a local festival that you guys put on is the route they take for the local festival to kind of work for one of those Uh, security teams they hire or I don't know. Can you kind of lay that out? Yeah. So we, uh, anybody can email us by the way, it's info at dwpresents.com. We are always looking for people to come and help locally. We're always looking for more hands. We're always like, we, we try to do that. We try to feed, you know, the cities that we go to and stuff like that. So we're more than happy to work with people and um, provide opportunities like that. And it's just good to be able to come on site and whether it be, you know, in a security manner or whether it be, you know, giving us hands when it comes to bartending or any of our concessions vendors or anything like that. It, you know, merch handlers, it's good to just be on site and be able to see how it all works. Because once you get hired on, you'll be there from before doors end till after the end. Yeah. I- I imagined, you know, seeing even things like them laying a bunch of rock on the ground or all these things that happen at a festival can be so educational for somebody who's never toured or never worked in that space. And kind of like you, you know, assisted or interned or worked under people before you got to where you're at today, it helped you get this full picture, this, you know, understand the whole spectrum. So when you're in your position, you know what these other people are going through. And I'm sure being a talent buyer now, after working with agents before made your job. You understood both sides of it, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Halfway through saying that, I was like, I hope I understood her job enough to make sure that I got <laughs> that correct. I was like, I think I got no, this. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, cool. I mean, I know that when I initially reached out to you, what, what inspired me, like we spoke earlier, was the When We Were Young Festival. And I know we relate and agreed that there was a lot of misconceptions and those resulted in people texting us, even people in the industry saying, is this real? What do you think Let's see if we can kind of come up with some of those misconceptions and squash them more or less. But the main thing I thought was, how come people thought that this just wasn't possible? What do you, what do you think? What do you, you know what I mean? Like they were like, oh, this isn't going to work. It's going to be a fire fest. Why were people thinking that? I mean, I think the pure magnitude of the amount of bands on there. Yeah. Was unfathomable. It just looks crazy. You know, um, it looks insane. And so when people were like, wait, how can they put all of these bands in one day? Uh, yeah, it was the amount of bands and the fact that it was a one day festival. I think people were just like, there's no way. There's no freaking way. I mean, but you have festivals, although they're much bigger. And I admit their ad mats look a little bit different than this one. You have festivals yeah. like Coachella who easily put that many artists in a single day and nobody ever looked. I mean, is it just because it's a new festival and maybe how the ad mat looked? Yeah, how the ad, it's. Absolutely how the ad mat looked. Good on them. Um, yeah, we were messing around and I t- we took, our creative team took Welcome to Rockville, one of our festivals, and put each band logo on an ad mat. Just, it, it looks insane. The ad yeah. mat in and of itself, <laughs> because of how it's done, it looks insane. But if you were to take them and write them out like a regular ad mat, it doesn't look as crazy. Yeah, not using their logos. 
Yeah, not losing, using their logos, using type, you know, headliners a little bigger and listing them. It's not like, it doesn't look as crazy as this ad, Matt. <laughs> it definitely doesn't, but. Yeah, we had a uh, Kellen from the story so far in here a few episodes ago, and he was making some jokes online about the validity of the festival, which we're not, we're kind of fueling the fire. But one of his yeah. main things he told me too, is like, did you see the ad, Matt? It like, and I guess the bands just, you know, they had, and maybe you can speak to this when bands were agreeing to play this, do you think the festival told them everybody that would be on it? Or could they have just said, you know, my Cam Paramore headlining, do you want to play? I think the festival probably told them the headliners and then said pretty much every band in and around your genre. Um, yeah. and went with it. I don't know what that ad mat approval was like, <laughs> nor can I really speak to if it was approved or not. I mean, like, this is not a leak. This is official. Yeah. I mean, uh, props to them because it looks, it looked massive. It is massive, you know? Yeah. But another thing is, is obviously on the business side of the industry, everyone's talking and stuff like that. And promoters talk to each other, you know, um, we talk to other talent buyers, we talk to other festival promoters and we knew right away how they were going to make it happen stage wise and how they were going to make it happen you know, just in that kind of operations capacity, as well as the fact that there were going to be other days that were added on, which kind of gives a festival a buffer. Yeah. Yeah. When you see something like that, you know, and I think it's, yeah, they, I don't know what I'm going to say. Yeah, it was cool. <laughs> I mean, so, I mean, and this might speak to how little I use social networking or just my lack of being in touch with the general word around festivals. Some stuff did get to me on when we were young, but what were the other things that people complained about? I know I'm making you do my job, but do you remember what else kind of arose from when we were young festival that people were skeptical about? I, I think some of the bands were a little upset because of the ad mat. I think okay. that um, when it went, on sale, um, I mean, there are people in those queues for three, four hours, and then you just got to be on a wait list. And so no one knew if they were going to get the tickets or not. And is that bad design or is that just a product of how something this big works? Or how does it work knowing what you know? Like, I don't know all the information, you know, that goes into selling tickets uh, and lines. And It was just the pure magnitude of how many people were interested okay. in that festival. Like, no back end could have done that. I think... I have, oh, I can't believe I have all this. And when we're talking about it, I'm like, this isn't even my festival and I have all this information. I think like <laughs> 700,000 people went and clicked on their website the first day of that being announced. Almost a million people went to the website. That's a lot of people. And that's like, that's huge for, that's huge for a festival, you know? Um, I mean, they sold out right away. Yeah. As a person who puts on festivals, is that kind of the goal? Like you want to make, is, is that what people want to do? They want a festival that, I mean, it, it, maybe that's too much to be a goal. This might be an outlier, but do you, in, from your world, like if you guys sold out a festival in one day, would that be insane or have you? I don't know. Oh, it's incredible. I think we're, we, we do. I mean, we can put blind pre-sales up for, especially for like Aftershock, you know, yeah. I mean, we could put our festival on sale without a single band announced and sell 10,000 tickets. Cause the brand is so strong and people yeah, know that it's going to be bands they like. Yeah. And everyone knows the product that they're going to get. It's, it's a, the festival has become a brand and an entity in and, of, in and of itself. I think with festivals, like when we were young, it just completely super serves a demographic that doesn't have a home right now. Like these warp tour kids, they, they don't have a home at this moment in time. So when this was announced, it was like mind blowing. They felt like you know, they'll finally have a place to be able to go and see all their bands again. Yeah, you have Warped Tour kids going to DJ nights playing their music. That's how much they need a festival. Yep, absolutely. Oh, I was going to ask, lastly, I wanted to kind of know if we had the security guard on here, Sully. Do you know Sully? Security guard from Warped Tour. Good dude. I've heard of him so often. Like, I've heard of him and I've never met him before. Amazing. If you ever get the chance to meet him under whatever, I think he's with Billy right now, but amazing dude, such a kind yeah. guy, but he came on and kind of did what you're doing right now, but with uh, festival security and broke down the incidents that happened at Astroworld for me so I could understand it. Have big incidents like that affected the way you guys run your festivals? Like, do you have to tighten anything up because of potential things that could happen? Or is that 
not really affected your world? It's a massive conversation. We had Welcome to Rockville in November, a week and a half after this happened. Um, yeah. It was It's nerve wracking because kind of all eyes are on the festival promotion world at that point in time. It was, it was just such an extreme saddening event that you, you really have to be cautious. Absolutely. It's, it's more conversations to be had. It's more, you know, training for security guards. It's, you know, preparing for if something like that happens, because that brings a new element of danger, you know, which, yeah, it changed every time an incident with mass scale events happens, whether, what was the country festival in Las Vegas? With the shooting? The shooting. Yeah. Uh, um, I mean, it's called it Route 91 Harvest. Route 91, yeah. I mean, anytime something like that happens, it br- it sheds light on a weakness, kind of, or something that can potentially be a weakness in mm-hmm. these type of events. So, yeah, everybody has to continue to have those conversations, change with what the times are, make sure the extra security is in place, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I do not feel for Sully. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he's got a he's got a hard job. I think he's he's in charge of a security company and he's also a security guard himself. And I say security guard, but he's personal security. So he's like great guy for information. He's been in the industry a really long time. I think he used to work for the Beastie Boys and start out in rap in the nineties. And it was like if you worked rap in the nineties in security, you're kind of you you're good. You're you've been through a lot. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, thank you so much for coming on today. That kind of sums up the questions I had for you. I really appreciate you sharing so much information with us about, you know, what you guys do at Danny Wimmer and what you do specifically. Absolutely. I hope it all made sense. I know it's a lot of information, but I hope everyone kind of like gets to see the inner workings of what it takes to put on a festival. Yeah. Nobody just shows up and slaps, even though it looks like it, they don't slap a bunch (laughs) of logos on and announce a festival without a plan, especially people like Live Nation, AEG or, you know, Danny Wimmer, anybody on that level. Very prepared. Very, very prepared. Well, I look forward to coming to one of your festivals and having a new appreciation for everything that goes into it. Best of luck with all your festivals you've announced this year. If you're announcing any more, best of luck with those as well, too. Festivals are back. COVID is going away, hopefully. And I'm yeah. excited for music. Me too. Me too. All right. Well, thank you so much, Amanda. I appreciate your time. Thank you.